let's look at psalm i want um, us to see the nature of psalm nature of psalms so when i talk about the nature of psalms <clears throat> i wanted to i may not go into all the details because of um, uh, there are certain things that we already discussed in hermeneutics but still i will uh, take you through details those are important for psalm right so let's look at psalm and its nature so remember yesterday we looked at superscriptions and selah what are its implications how should we understand selah is one of the difficult thing uh, and so i know that some people when they read psalm they read selah also it's up to them right if you want to read selah you can read um, but well, we are not really sure what exactly that um, word signifies that is what i said most probably this is part of we saw that maybe lifting up your voice raising the audience voices as they sing the songs now let's look at uh, the nature of psalm looking at the future of the psalms we're going to look at uh, subjects such as religious lyric poetry right that's the main thing we are going to look at first then we will look at some of the uh, evocative language uh, of psalms and some of the structure so psalm is it is poetry right it is poetry it is poems psalms are poems hebrew songs but they are religious poetry right so what are the things if you know literature and if you are a person who has been in a studied uh, literature you might see some of the things that we are talking here what is poetry uh, it is a language of images and use of comparison so if you look at any poetry that is what you are going to see a lot of images right images and it is more more highly concentrated and its structure is more highly structured than prose prose is something that you just keep on writing you may not use much comparisons you you might compare in prose but you may not use a lot of them whereas poetry has got a lot of comparisons following chart reflects a continuum that we see in comparing the act of communication that ranges from closely structured oral use of language to highly structured poetic use of language so if you look at uh, speech us together there are three ways you can speak three ways one is an ordinary speech that speech is maybe you are you know you are talking to some people or you are and you are speaking in a church we usually use some kind of loosely structured uh you know in our language is kind of loosely structured we we might do chit chat we might preach uh the structure is not so high unless Uh, you know except you know you are a highly qualified i mean a highly educated orator you know you are a preacher who can communicate so so well maybe you have more you know uh, good uh, structure of the language otherwise usually what our speech is loosely structured then prose is the that comes in the middle it has got structure yes people write novels people write short stories people write um, histories right these are all come under one prose yes there are images but not much but it is structured right you begin you have an introduction and things like that and many of our preaching also can be sometime uh, uh, come under prose right prose but the third one poetry poetry is highly structured use of language it is very structured whether you know you look at 
poems that you have learned in your schools, you will see how beautiful it is. It is colorful, right? Images, comparisons, and various ways, you know, the emotion of the poet is, is painted in a way that people are attracted so much into those songs, right? And so those who love poems and songs, you understand the reason is because of the, the color that they, they throw into their, their thoughts and how they arrange, uh, you know, according to the rules of poems. But imagine, imagine you are not dealing with 21st century poems. You are not dealing with 20th century poems. You are dealing with thousands of years ago written poems, right? So there may be few things that we may not, we may not understand, or, you know, like maybe some of the rhythms, right? Rhythms and styles, but still there are many same even today. Even the songs that you write today are, if you look at those songs that are written thousands of years ago, you can see similarities, all right? So uh, poems, are, poems are various kinds, but a lyric poem is characterized by its abbreviated nature. So I say it is religious lyric poetry. There are poems of various times, but a lyric poem is always not much. It is abbreviated. So what is religious poetry, lyric poetry? It is the communication of a, of, okay. Poet's thoughts and feelings as prompted by his understanding of God and his work, right? That is what religious lyric poetry. It is thoughts and feelings of poets that is prompted by his understanding of God and his word. This thing of Yahweh's creation of the earth, these poets sing Yahweh's creation. And they also sing about his deliverance in the past. They to rejoice over the law and celebrate various aspects of worship. So that is what you mainly say. All right, now let's go to the language itself. It is evocative language, right? So what is this evocative language means? It is because of its conciseness and artistic elements. It is known as evocative. This concentration of form is achieved through use of parallelism. Don't worry, we are going to look at that, right? Pa you know, I, I was astonished to see parallelism in the Hebrew poetry. And I know that, you know, when I learned my, in my childhood, I learned songs in Malayalam poems in the schools. And there are a lot of parallelism, right? You know, parallel lines comes parallel. And I never knew the importance of that one. But coming to learn to read song, learning, reading in a way that it is, uh, you know, thinking from poet's viewpoint, reading that song, so fantastic. And it's so, so beautiful. And yes, you can enjoy, but understand this is God's word. That is also is, uh, is there that gives us the joy to read songs. And brevity of language, conciseness, and images, and images also uh, is quite, quite interesting. And there are many, there are many, but now, one of the common figurative language would be what? This two. This is, these are the common ones. Simile and metaphor. Right? These are the common ones. 
Huh? All right. If you wanted to see this, this figurative language, where should you go? Psalm 1. Let's, let's look at Psalm 1 itself. Right? Open your Bibles today to Psalm 1. Um, let's look at verse 3. Can one of you please read? Verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. All right. If you look at if you look at Psalm 1, verse 3, you see comparison, right? He, he, he will be like, right? So if you anywhere if you read see the word like or as, you know that two terms, that is comparison. Any time it is a figurative language, and it says he will be. Who is that? This blessed man, whose delight is in the law of the Lord. This blessed man is like a tree that is planted. That is poet psalmist is comparing the blessed man into a tree that is planted. But his comparison is not not over. He also compares a wicked man. What do you see? Look at verse 4. Look at verse 4 of Psalm 1. Not verse. so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Yeah, the wicked are like chaff. So comparison is given for the wicked as well. Chaff that, you know, it won't sustain. They will blow away very quick. They will go away very quick. So, friends, this comparison uh, is so, so much you will see in the psalm. So, any place where you see like or as, that is similar. similar. Then what is metaphor? What is metaphor? Can anyone say what is metaphor? Huh? Any any idea? What is metaphor? If simile is used to compare, what could be metaphor is used? No problem. Metaphor also is used for comparison. Right? Comparison. But without like or as. Any time there is a comparison made without like or as. So it is like this way. All right. Um, uh, it's, so similar metaphor is, okay, it is A is like B. Yes, that is what it is. But uh, <clears throat> in similar, what do you do? A simile declares that A is like B, right? Whereas, Whereas metaphor, maybe it is the most dominant uh, images used in the Old Testament. It doesn't use like or as. It doesn't use. What it does, it's compared. Like A is B. Like A represents B. You see? A represents B. Now, let's look at Psalm 84, verse 10. Psalm 84. Let's read that one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Next verse. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. Wait a second. Right. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. That's actually verse 11. And yes. Shannon, what is, well, what is Sam is doing here? The Lord is the Lord God, Yahweh God is sun and a shield. 
what is it saying? Is. A is B. Yeah. What is it? What is it trying here? Uh, God uh, is like sun. Yeah. And he's right. Like it is kind of comparison. Hmm. But it all does, the characters of the sun are yeah. implied on yeah. God. Ah, yes. Taking the character qualities, characteristics of sun and shield, both of them, and attributing to God. God is like a sun. God is like a shield for your life. But doesn't use that in a combative language of like or as, right? So here, God represents the, you know, you know, God is represented by sun and shield, right? So these are, you know, simile and metaphor. It is very quite common. Then there are rest of the things I have already looked, I have said, explained, for example, look at the note personification. You know, it is uh, giving uh, uh, giving human emotions to non-human object. See, human emotions to non-human object. For example, the sea looked, <laughs> but maybe maybe someone who doesn't understand how Psalm is written would say, "How can sea look? Does it have eyes?" Right. So this is what personification, right? These are, I have already talked about in hermeneutics quite a bit. And then you have hyper, hyper, hyperbole, hyperbole, you know, hyperbolic statement. It is what? Exaggeration. Yes. Intentional exaggeration. Like we would say, I told you a million times huh? <laughs> not to do that. A million times. You are never told a million times, but exaggerating. For example, Psalm 40, right? This is what we read. For evils beyond number, you see, have surrounded me. Yes. So you have, you know, all these kinds of things. I'm not going to explain metonymy, metonymy of the association and sin, and, and uh, uh, syndake, right? Substituting for one for the other one. Uh, and nature, right? Uh, that is something I I don't know, right? This is something in Hebrew poetry, right? Uh, that you know you need to maybe be born in Hebrew and to learn to sing those songs to know the meter and the rhythm of the psalm. But understand, these psalms were written with a meter and rhythm, right? Me, there is there are there are there are you know. You know, uh, political notes that are like like the psalm the songs that we sing, right? The rhythms were there. Uh, made the, you know the length when ra raise your voice when you bring down. Everything's are there. But in okay, and if you look at YouTube, maybe there may be some people singing Hebrew songs. Uh, if especially songs are being sung Hebrew in a Hebrew, yeah, Hebrew song. You can listen to them. Uh, they will say what psalm it is. And you can look at the psalm. And uh, sometimes my children love to hear those songs. Um, I also love to hear sometimes. It's very, very interesting, you know, how they sing. The tune is different. But I think, I, I, I assume that uh, the, the, the way that they sing these songs now, perhaps, might be almost similar when during the time of David and when they saw, sung the songs. You know, I think in this is pretty much similar. All right. So, yes, uh, it is there. Meter and rhythm is there. Uh, <clears throat> and, but it is, it's not a significant problem in interpreting some. You know, as far as we are concerned, it's not an issue at all. Even you don't understand. Meter rhythm. I don't know. Uh, you may not know. 
it's not an issue at all in our understanding of Psalm. That is for sure. Right now, what I want, I want to spend some time in parallelism. Right? Parallelism. This is important, especially in Psalm. Right? What is that? It is how one, one line corresponds to another poetic line. How this is corresponding. Usually this corresponds, but how does it? Parallelism is a phenomenon, right? It's a phenomenon whereby two or more successive poetic lines, right? One line is written, then two or three lines written to strengthen, reinforce, or develop each other's thought. That is what parallelism. It develops, reinforce, or strengthen. Right? So as such, <coughs> parallelism <coughs> is an additional thought, and it is an additional one. Right? So it, it helps to uh, look at Psalm uh, and how his thoughts are, uh, you know, emphasized, right? Maybe how, how do they do? Sometimes they further define the same line that is given in the beginning. Maybe by the specify, expand, intensify, or sometimes they contrast, right? Which is very important, right? So uh, Berlin has compared parallelism with the human vision, human vision, right? Uh, parallelism focuses the message on itself, but its vision is binocular. Or how do you say binocular? I don't know. Okay, what binocular? Binocular. Um, you look at like binocular, like a human vision. It superimposes to slightly different views of the same object, right? From their convergence, it produces a sense of depth. Uh, the, that's, that's how Sam is color his song. He wants to communicate one point, but he wants to say that same point in different ways, right? So what are the ways, what are the different types of parallelism? Different times, right? We are going to look at number one, synonymous parallelism. That's, that's quite common. You know synonym? Right, synonym. Meaning. Yes, yeah, you know it's a, it's a different wording, right? Yeah, it, it is so much used to there in the uh, so far. Let's look at Psalm two here. Example now on the screen, on the screen. This is famous song, right? We all know the song. Uh, you know, so look, for example, look at how the song is written, right? Uh, why are the nations in uproar? And the people devising a vain thing. All right? Right? Why are the nations opposed? Look at the second verse. Yeah, uh, you know, this why are the nations opposed? Same thing is said in a different way. Kings of the earth take their stand. Now, now the why should be here also. Why the kings of the earth take a their stand? This why should be why is introduced only one place. It should come everywhere. Why people devising a vain thing? Why kings of the earth take their stand? And why? Why rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed? Right? So this is what, what you see. It is the same thing, friends. The nations of war or kings of the earth that take stand. This is same, same, the same thing in a different language. So here parallels, for example, peoples, nations are parallels, devising a vain thing. And are in a pro 
is the same, is our parallels. And why is used explicitly in the first line, but it is implied in the second line, right? So this is a common poetic device known as ellipsis. Even though it is given in the beginning, but it, it follows, right? So we should, we, we should say, why are the people's device in a vain thing? Even though you don't have why in the second line, even though it is the same question is being asked, why people do this? Same thing is said in a different way. That is what poetry, right? Poetry is what? You know, is saying, explaining something with the colorful languages. That's what poetry. And we need to look at things that way. So this is synonymous parallelism. Synonymous parallelism is quite common. Second is contrastive parallelism. This is also quite common. These two are quite common. Right. What is contrasting? In order to say, communicate the idea, right? They use opposite to synonymous, not saying the same thing, but saying the opposite, bringing the opposite idea to show intense, maybe emphasize, strengthen the idea. All right? <clears throat> so, uh, that this is to say, uh, this has incorrectly been taken to mean two opposite positions of DNA. No, this is not the point of contrasting parallelism, though at times both the lines put together make up the opposition. But with the contrasting parallelism, one proposition is made. One proposition made, but expressed from two opposite perspectives. One idea is explained to different ways with the contrast. Because the book of Proverbs is contrasting the lifestyle and rewards the godly with the lifestyles and rewards of the wicked, right? You see that is in the book of Proverbs. So contrastive parallelism is the dominant type of parallelism used in Proverbs. For example, Look at this verse here in the, on the screen. What do you see? It is taken from Proverbs 10, verse 1. You see, a wise son and a foolish son. Sam is, you know, the, proverb, the writer of the proverb wants to say, you need to be wise. You need to be wise son. In order to say the what is the good thing of a wise son is that he makes father glad. And he says, you need to be wise. You need to be a wise son. Otherwise, what will happen? You are at grief. Well, think about something here. Maybe we might be, if you might be, you might be too technical here by looking at this verse. Uh, okay, why son makes father glad? How about mother glad? Will Mike's why son makes mother also glad? Huh? Pastor, like he is. Uh, the word he is used universally, not mentioning the gender, maybe like that. But but here mother also is mentioned, so so that won't but, come here. A wise son makes a father glad. My my question is, does a wise son makes his mother also glad? Yes, uh, I would say yes. Another question, a foolish son is a grief to his mother. Is he not a grief to his father? Ah, yes. Implied. Yes, implied. implied. Yes. So this is the point. See, when you look at, look at the, this is poetic style. This is the style of writing. 
right? Of course, we know that a wise son makes father and mother glad, a foolish son may grie brings grief to father and mother for sure, we know, right? So what simply it says, the point of the proverb is to stress that wise child brings joy to parents. That's the point, right? Joy to parents. So this is what, this is what contrastive parallelism, right? Contrastive parallelism. So you have a synonymous parallelism. Second is contrast. And third, third is subordination. Some people say this is part of synonymous parallelism, um, but but I think good number of scholars say this has this this is a separate category of parallelism in the poet in in poetic books known as subordination, right? What is that? What is that? The one line is grammatically subordinated to the other line, right? We already looked at this Psalm 137. You see, this is written after the exile. You know, that means written very late, very late, uh, collected by Ezra. So it is here. What is said by the reverse of Babylon? There we sat down and wept. This is the main clause, right? And there is something more added that is subordinate. This is a in Hebrew, this is known as a temporal clause by you know using a war here. A when in Hebrew, it is done as subordinated to the first one. It, it simply uh, gives a little more explanation here. All right. So it says by the reverse of Babylon. There we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Zion. So people sat on the reverse of Babylon and they wept because it's when did they do that? When they wept, when they remembered Zion. <clears throat> now, why, it, why do we say this is separate? I mean, good number of scholars say it is, it is separate kind of parallelism. Is that None of words in the second line has a synonymous or contrastive correspondence with the first line. There is no contrast. There is no synonymous. And simply, it simply, you know, subordinate, gives some more explanation to the first line. Then we have fourth type of parallelism. Fourth type. What is that? Comparison. <clears throat> Comparing. Very common, very common, right? Um, this, is, this is also called as emblematic parallelism. So if you happen to read some other books, they say emblematic, fine, the same thing. This is, yes, related to preceding, like subordinate category, but it is kind of comparison. Comparison is made between two lines in a, such a way that it forms a, Simile, right? Right, simile. Let's look at. Here is a comparison. This is a very common verse. That's the reason this verse is taken. Just as a father, you know, when, when the moment you see um, there that word as, you know that this is kind of simile comes. Yes, this is a comparison, but it is not some uh, a word is compared to something. It is. Entire line comes as a comparison. Entire line comes as a comparison. So, just as the father has compassion on his children, that is comparative clause, right? That is, so comparison, compassion of a father upon his children is used to compare the compassion of the Lord. So the Lord has the compassion on those who fear him. Okay? So it compares. So learn that comparison. Now you might have preached, but now you learn technical terms used for these kinds of things, right? And this is used in many other places in song. 
All right, that is what about parallelism. So remember, four types of parallelism. Synonymous par parallelism, mm -hmm. contrastive parallelism, and then you have subordinate parallelism, then comparison is there, right? Compa comparing, for example, someone could be comparing uh, the two extreme ends. It can be also, see, uh, Simon says comparing blessed man and a wicked man. Yes, can be taken that way. All right, I want us to go a little further now today. Historical setting of Psalm. How do you know historical setting of Psalm? Remember yesterday I said 116 Psalms has got superscriptions, right? Superscriptions. Superscriptions provide some kind of information about the historical setting. There are maybe other 34 Psalms are known as orphan Psalms. So now, not only by superscription, but by looking at some Psalm itself, you may be able to identify when this Psalm is written. Psalm 2. Let's look at Psalm 2 again. Uh, Psalm 2 was written during a time of turmoil in Israel. Right? Because remember, Psalm is coming. Why the nations take a stand against the Lord? Nations, kings of the earth. And Acts chapter 425 tells that this is written by David. Okay. So who wrote Psalm 2? David, for sure. So if you look at those two combined, then you understand uh, this psalm was written during the time of turmoil, during a reign of David. Right? During the reign of David. So there are ways you may be able to compare by other uh, verses to find out the historical setting. Right, so I would say a good exegetical commentary should help you always. Right, exegetical commentary. Right, and uh, for example, Psalm 121. What is that? Do you know the, any 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 Psalm 121? It's a very famous song. I lift up my eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? Yes. Do you know when do you, when when do, when do they sing this song? Hmm? When they go up the mountain. Yeah, oh yes, they when they go to the go to the go to Jerusalem for worship, right? If you happen to if you happen to be in Israel, I think you should go. Not because not 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 as a pilgrimage, but to know, to study, and understand every place our Lord has been, where he was born, lived, and died. I think it's something you need to see if you have if you wanted to go and uh, go to a place, you should plan going to Jerusalem, I would say, I mean to Israel. And if you have been there, then you'll know that Jerusalem, which is the capital of Israel now, is actually a mountain, the top of a mountain, right? You need to climb to that area, right? Which is where city of David is, which is where Christ was crucified, where all the actions in the last chapters of Gospels are happening. It is there. So may you know, should go and look at it. So, yes, it looks like Psalm 121, is sung when they climb the hills. All right. So I have given you more information. Now what I wanted to do is to look at the three-part structure of lyric poetry. All right. I think we don't have that much time to explain. I need some time, friends. But yes, this is the most important thing. If you wanted to really study a song, three-part structure of lyric poetry. 
Otherwise, you never, you will never interpret some properly, right? So I think we will leave that one for tomorrow.